The BFI's Stanley Kubrick season here at the South Bank has just opened, so I'd like to begin, if I might, with Clockwork Orange, but we'll do a flashback and so on. Yes, please. How did Stanley Kubrick first approach you about the part of Alex? I got a call from my agent saying that Stanley Kubrick just wanted to talk to me, and I went, well, what about? He goes, well, he wouldn't say. <laughs> I went, oh, okay, well... And then I, I, was, I was doing a movie with uh, Brian Forbes at Elstree. And uh, Stanley lived in Boreham Wood. It was a five-minute drive of, away. So in my lunch hour, I went to see him. And um, I was a you know, very young actor and uh, completely naive about who the hell Kubrick was. I actually thought I was going to meet uh, Stanley Kramer. Oh, very good. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> Got the initials right. Yeah, yeah, so I just kept quiet about anything, of course, and just listened to him. And um, it was just really small talk in my lunch hour. And uh, so I said, well, I've, I've got to get back to the set stand. So it's really nice seeing you. Was there anything particular? And he said, uh, well, I got this book. And um, I said, well, what is it? He, he didn't want to show me the title, I, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, he goes, well, uh, I'd like, okay, uh, have you heard of a clockwork orange? I went, no. He goes, really? It's a cult. I said, sorry, I'm not in that cult. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And um, <clears throat> he said, anyway, would you read it and then call me? So. Uh, I read it first off, and I, I honestly, I couldn't make head and a tail of it. <laughs> you know, there's all of this weird language. I had to keep going back to the glossary at the back and trying to figure it out. And I thought, oh, my God, this will, yeah, how the hell are they going to make a film of this? So I thought, well, I better read it again because this is serious stuff if he really wants me to do it, you know. And when I read it again, I realized, my God, this is a brilliant bit of writing by Anthony Burgess. So I, then I read it the third time, <laughs> and, and I realized, holy God, what a part. Mm. So I called him back. This is after a week. Yeah, I love the fact you waited a week you know, yeah, to I call did. back Stanley Kubrick. Most people would call you know, within the hour. <laughs> well, I wanted to be sure that, uh, and by the way, uh, after that, I, I, I was walking down Notting Hill Gate, and there was my friend, Ian Holm, and he said, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm going off to do this movie with this Stanley Kubrick, this American. And he went, Stanley Kubrick? Huh, be careful. <laughs> I went, oh, why? He goes, he's promised you a part, right? I went, well, yes, I, 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 he's offered me this part, and uh, you know, we're shooting in a month, I think. And he said, well, listen, he offered me Napoleon. 18 months he kept me on a string, <laughs> and then he never. Then I couldn't get him on the phone. So I went, well, and then having known Stanley, of course, that makes perfect sense. And um, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. But, um, but it had been around for a while, because yes. the book was written in six, uh, published in 62, written in 1961. Yes. And there was talk originally of Mick Jagger playing Alex. There was talk. And, and, he, and the Beatles also, as the Droogs. The Beatles? The yeah, at one point. Oh, I remember the, the musical papers sort of were speculating. It sounds a bit far-fetched. You said Ringo as did, well, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, <laughs> that would have been uh, perfect. Yeah, indeed. But, uh, so, uh, but, the, but the movie utterly depends on Alex. He's on screen the yes. whole time. So uh. Kubrick's project completely depended on you. Well, he told me that he'd put it aside because he couldn't find anyone to play the part. So... Um, and Christiana Kubrick, his uh, widow, told me uh, uh, five, six years ago that uh, he, wa he w was really very uh, excited to see this Lindsay Anderson film, If, which was my first film. He, uh, they brought the, um, the reels over to his house and had a projectionist, you know, there 24-7. And he watched If, and he apparently watched my first scene it's a great cue. We've got it just coming up. Have you? Yeah, yeah. He hit the. Well, well do you hang on for the story. Hit the. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, no, please. He, he hit the, um, you know, the, the the speaker button and said, uh, "Relace that," and he did it four times. Watch the scene. Turned to Christiana and said, "We found our Alex." Fantastic. Well, this is the scene, ladies and gentlemen. The first clip from If. 
uh, where Mick has arrived back at school and has gone into the study with his friend, and this was the scene that got Malcolm the part. Can we have the first clip, please? And that was the scene where Stanley Kubrick kept apparently, saying, relace it, apparently, relace it. Appa apparently. You can see it, particularly, when do we live? That's what I want to know, and that look in your eyes. Yeah, yeah you can see it's why a great does. line. Did you, did you ask Stanley Kubrick in that early stage about how to play Alex? I mean, you know, where, did, where does actually, the character Christopher. come from? Yes, how did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, listen, it, it was a very organic sort of process. You know, we went to the house, had Chinese take away for lunch, this is a, a, an average day, uh, talked about God knows what, lenses, Napoleon, this, that, and the other. I noticed that he would have um, a stewed pear and then a piece of chicken, and I'd say, well, that's interesting, the way that you eat your food. Um, is there any reason why you'd have dessert and then um, a piece of chicken, you know? Um, I was interested, to, and he goes, that's how Napoleon ate. <laughs> went, oh, really? It all goes down the same way. So I figured, well, he doesn't, he's not really into sort of gourmet food, you know, um, the way I sort of was. Um, you know, there's nothing better, is there, than a wonderful lunch or dinner. But anyway, um, if you went out with Stanley, you knew that it would probably be, you know, the Indian in Boreham Wood. Now, now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's hardly a gourmet deal. And, and he also had this uh, extraordinary sort of theory about Chinese restaurants. So he thought that this, he goes, this is the way the Chinese, you know, use their spies. I mean, what better way? And I go, well, what, the, what are they spying on in Boreham Wood, for God's sake? It's, it's the most boring place on earth. <laughs> And he goes, no, that's how they do it. Uh, so he had lots of theories, you know, and, and he was lots of fun. God, the man was such great fun to be with. I absolutely loved him. And so it really was a collaboration. Uh, it sounds uh, rather vain to say that when we're talking about Stanley Kubrick, but look at the film. For you, instance, couldn't get him, you couldn't get him to focus on how to play no, Alex. no, because, and thank you, I'll come back to your original question. <laughs> I wish you'd stop doing that, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know you're rather irritated with me. Anyway, we'll get No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, I did say to him, Stanley, how, uh, have you got any ideas about this particular scene? And he just looked at me and he said, well, that's why I hired you. Yeah, well. And as a joke, I said, oh, of course, and here's a call sheet, and on it, it goes, Director S. Kubrick. How about a bit of direction, Stanley? That would be nice. And he just walked off and laughed, you know. <laughs> but I realized, driving home after this conversation, that he'd actually given me, as an actor, the greatest gift of all. He'd said, show me. You're free to show me and do any damn thing you want. Mm. And I figured that, and you know, then I began to think, well, you know, who's he worked with? You know, Peter Sellers, of course. And Peter Sellers is the perfect example of a Kubrick actor who will do funny faces, voices, walks, and God knows what, and Stanley could just pick. Mm. And that's what he loved to do. So he wasn't really a, 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 an actor's director in, that, in the traditional sense. Whereas Lindsay Anderson, for instance, who was a theater director, was completely um, an actor's director in that he was, uh, it was a safe place with him. Mm. Uh, even though he was a real curmudgeon, and my God, I've heard him scream at the crew. But with his actors, he was extremely loyal and loving. And but didn't they have one thing in common, which is they would never tell you when you were doing it well? Either of them. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, of course. God knows, uh, don't ever give an actor a compliment. I mean, it's not a bad thing, though, honestly. I mean, there's Hugh Hudson's here somewhere. He's a, a bit like that, never says, well done, old pal. <laughs> never says anything like that. And, um, you know, I've worked with him. I've known the man for 50 years. You'd think he'd have some generosity as to 
doesn't at all. Um, and, and most directors like that, you know, they're, they're all the same in that, yes. But you, you did go to Lindsay Anderson, didn't you, to ask him about his take on the character at an early I did. stage? I did, I did. Actually, what happened was we had eight months or nine months of pre-production. And for instance, and I will get back to this question, <laughs> but I'm going to meander a little Stay bit. Quiet. Because he said to me, um, well, actually, I said to him, well, Stanley, you know, what am I going to wear? And he goes, I don't know. What do you got? Well, we're doing a film that's supposed to be futuristic. What have I got? I mean, you know, I live in Notting Hill Gate, for Christ's sake. I mean, I'm wearing jeans and a T-shirt. I said, well, I've got my uh, cricket gear in the car. And he goes, oh, great. Well, let's see it. So I put it on. He goes, oh, yeah. And um, what's this? I said, that's the protector. He said, wear it on the outside. <laughs> and that's basically how that. Yeah. Yeah. That iconic costume uh, came to be. Anyway, so um, what was your original question? <laughs> you were doing very well. No, Lindsay Anderson, you asked his advice. Having not got any from Stanley Cooper, yeah. you go and see Lindsay Anderson. I panicked. I panicked. I thought, I, we've talked all the way around this part, and I really, I don't know how to play it. That's the truth. I haven't got a clue. Um, you know, I know what I'm wearing now. I know this, I know that, but I don't know anything about this. So I called Lindsay and said, would you mind reading this script? You know, uh, big groan. Um, he said, you better bring it over. So I go over, he read it, and I came back and uh, to his flat when he'd read it. And the first thing he said was, thank God I don't have to direct this. <laughs> Re really reassuring. <laughs> I went, it's not your kind of movie, Lindsay. We know that. Look, how the hell am I going to play this character? And he honestly, he gave me probably the greatest piece of direction I've ever had from a director. Excuse me, Hugh. <laughs> Which was... He goes, well, Malcolm, there is a scene in If where you get beaten by the prefects, where you open the gymnasium doors, and there's a close-up when you look at the prefects and smile. He goes, that's how you play the part. That's our second clip, Malcolm. <laughs> Would you believe? Well oh, done. my God, you're Fantastic. a genius, man. Very good. Could we have the second clip, please? <laughs> mm. It's a, it's a lovely moment where you just wipe away a tear with your back to the audience. It's a really lovely moment. That was uh, Lindsay Anderson. Yeah. He said, "That's, we'll get it from the back and just do that. I went, oh, brilliant. That's great, because others might do it you know, full frontal. It would kill the moment. Exactly. Um, but that surly smile as you come in, is, uh, which gets rather That's wiped off your face, is, that must have been the moment. Uh, um, yes, yes. From what you're saying about the jockstrap and other things. Mm. Um, Kubrick has this reputation in some of the books for being rather an inflexible character, but it sounds as if it was much more consultative on the set. You know, people chip, chipping in ideas. Oh, absolutely. He'd take an idea from anyone, you know. Um, he really would. And uh, yes, he, uh, look, he, you know, Stanley, uh, especially on the movie that I did, I mean, you know, that um, he would, uh, you know, listen. You know, we sat there, there's a famous story, I've told it a million times, but, you know, we sat there for five days and he passed me and said, can you dance? And I, I was so bored, I leapt up and said, I can dance. And I'm like, I can't dance, you know, but, and started singing in the rain and whacking the poor lady on the beat and um, he was laughing so much and then they ran off, bought the rights to singing in the rain and there we had the sequence. Um, it's just... I think when there's so much trust on set between an actor and the director that um, you're not afraid to... It's sort of creating an environment where people will chip yes. in creative ideas. I mean, I, look, a lot of the actors didn't feel that at all. Mm. Um, Pat McGee was like, um, what the fuck is this guy on about? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And there's no Guinness on the set. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to drink. I said, I'll, I'll see if I can do something about that, Pat. I went, Stanley, you know, um, 
McGee's Irish, and um, yeah, yeah, no, we got that, we got that. Yeah. They do like the Guinness, you know. And, and <clears throat> yeah. He goes, really? Well, well, why? I went, well, that's just the way they work, you know. I don't know. Um, why don't you get some Guinness for him? You know, put it on the prop truck. So they got a, a, a case of Guinness, and I think within three days, of course, it had gone. <laughs> Stanley came to me and he said, well, that was a great idea of yours. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, <laughs> I do, look how great he is in, in the park. Yeah. And uh, Pat would say to me, Jesus, does this guy know what he's doing? I'd say, well, why, Pat? He goes, he's had me in the wheelchair, and he said, oh, I feel like I'm taking a shit, and he wants more and more. <laughs> I went, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe. And of course, he, it, it needed to be that kind of crazed. Yeah, that was one of, the one of the few changes, actually, from the book, giving him this strange bodyguard played by Dave Prowse. Yes. Do you remember, called Julian, who does oh, all I these sort of could not jerks. forget that. That was added by, in the script by Stanley. Yes, because <laughs> Stanley wanted there to be, a, you know, a real heavy kind of bodyguard, and so he picked Dave, I think, from a picture, but it's when David Prowse opened his mouth, that's when we ran into a few problems. <laughs> because he had a West Country voice like that. <laughs> and he's very high voice, <clears throat> and he'll excuse me for saying this, but that's probably why they didn't, Use his voice for Darth Vader. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, look. Um, I mean, he had a terrific career from it. And playing Darth Vader's, I mean, that's quite something, isn't it? So, uh, but um, also Kubrick wanted him to lift Pat McGee in a wheelchair. And there was nobody strong enough that could do that. And actually, Stanley managed to ruin poor old Dave Prowse's uh, shoulder because he had him holding him for eight hours. Yeah. yeah. Plus, in the book, you know, you, you feel, why doesn't Alex run away? But if you've got the bodybuilder there oh. standing over the end, that, that justifies the fact you're trapped in the house. Yes. Because in the, in the book, you could just walk out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it's sort of justified in that way. I had a lot of fun shooting that because it was actually fun, you know, when Patrick comes back in and he's found out that I'm the one, you know, and he's, he was going, food, all right, <laughs> try the wine. <laughs> and I'm sitting, and I swear to God, I just copied uh, Morecambe, Eric Morecambe. Uh, that is my tribute to Eric Morecambe, because I'm sitting there with spaghetti going, oh, yes, sir, very fine, sir, thank you very much, sir. Oh, lovely, look at that, um, yeah, Santa Steph, uh, or whatever it is, and, and then, boom, into the spaghetti. So <laughs> it was uh, a lot of fun doing that. And well, one thing you do which doesn't come over in the book is you make Alex almost sympathetic at times. I mean, after the first 20 minutes, it's fairly relentless that this guy's a psychopath. Yes. But he loves music, he likes language. Uh, he has, and we feel on, in the second half, we're on his side as all these awful things are being done to him. Yes. That's quite a trick. I mean, you're the first sympathetic psychopath in film history. Me and Richard III. Richard III. <laughs> film history. Film history. Oh, okay. Uh, well, there was a film. That's true. That's true. But Olivier but I mean, did. You know, quite uh, good. Hannibal Lecter starts here. Yes, well, it... It was way before Hannibal Lecter, yeah, exactly. but I, I like to think that it kind of paved the way for that kind of, Because, of course, there was no uh, major studio would ever have, you know, their leading character in a movie as an immoral person. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Not going to happen. Um, but Kubrick had the power. He could do whatever he wanted. Yeah. I mean, when you've made Strange Love, Lolita, 2001, uh, I mean, they were so happy, thrilled to be in bed with him, you know. And mm. I remember we came back from dailies one day, and from uh, shooting to watch dailies, and we came into his driveway, and there were three Rolls Royces. And I was with Stanley, and he goes, oh, shit. Uh, um, I forgot. I went, what? what? Who? What's all this? He goes, oh, it's all the guys from Warner Brothers. Um, <laughs> Okay, come with me. And they were all sitting in the hallway of his house as he came in. They all jumped up, Stanley! They'd been waiting there hours, you know. Stanley, he'd forgotten about it. Uh, how are you? Yeah, great. And Stanley, yeah, great to see you. Um, 
Okay, well, listen, um, Malcolm and I are going to look at the dailies, so um, why don't you order some takeout and uh, get some Chinese, and we'll be with you uh, in a minute. Cause we went in there and watched dailies for an hour <laughs> and came out, and there was still... And he wouldn't even let them see a, a foot of film, nothing. Was he, do you think he was proving to them after 2001 that he could make a low-budget movie? Because yes. I think it cost about $2 million, uh, A Clockwork Orange or something. Yes, I, I believe so. But I, he exa that's what he told me. He goes, I just wanted to prove. <clears throat> you know, because he, the 2001 went on to tremendous overages. Yeah, yeah. Because th the technology was completely unknown, and Stanley invented it as he was going. And um, so when he came to do Clockwork, he was determined to make a small budget movie and bring it in, you know, uh, on, t on time and on budget, which he did. And a lot of it's made on existing locations. People think there's yeah. lots of sets in uh, Clockwork. But apart from the milk bar and a couple of sort of corridors and the scene with the two girls picked up at the record shop, yeah. those are the only sets as far as I can see. Well, the that wasn't a set. That was a real... Oh, was it? Flat that was just dressed. Right. So the only set built was the Corobo milk yeah. bar. Yeah. And that was some disused factory in Elstree. Yeah. And um, that's sort of a brilliant set, really. You know, it, it's incredible. Um, but, oh, yeah, I mean, um, that's the only one that he actually built. Everything else, Thames Mead, yeah. you know, this strange kind of... Um, and apparently it still exists. Um, it's still... Yes, the flat with the marina, with the water. You've given me another, another uh, cue, which is very good. Our first clip, <clears throat> our first clip from A Clockwork Orange. I've read your notes, your, No, no, you haven't, actually. <laughs> he hasn't. I've, you couldn't read them, I'm sure, but anyway. Um, no, you're chatting with the Droogs in yeah. the entrance to your tower, mansion block, your tower block. Oh, uh, yes. And then you're walking past the marina, uh, past the water in Thamesmead. And I think the first bit was shot in the entrance hall to the tower block is at uh, uh, the university, uh, which university? Bun Bunwell, um, no, is it Brunel University? Yeah, Brunel yeah. University, the yeah. entrance lobby, and yeah. then you're in Thamesmead, uh, which you can scarcely believe it actually exists, but there it is with yeah. the water. Can we have the first clip from A Clockwork Orange, please? Yeah. Wow. It's amazing how topical it still is in a way. I was thinking last night, you've got uh, knife crime, overcrowded prisons, gang warfare, truancy, uh, drugs, paedophilia, Mr. Deltoid, your probation officer, who is rather interested in you in your underpants, if you remember. Uh, yes, and, I do uh, remember. And all of that. It's all there in the movie. And so in 71, it must have been incredibly sort of uh, avant-garde in a way to deal with these Actually, issues. Actually, it was quite normal then. <laughs> We weren't really saying anything new. Yeah. It's amazing, I, actually, looking at this, because that sequence is the brilliance of Burgess and the dialogue. It's so great. And on, I think it's the only scene where Stanley really uses it when the gang are together. He never uses the NADSAT, or very sparingly. Yeah. And I, I kept asking him why. He, he, he said I, he didn't want to confuse the audience. Yeah. So I guess when the gang are together, it didn't really matter. You know, you, you get what it is anyway. You get the drift. But um, it, it's a stunning language, really. It yeah. really is sort of Shakespearean. One thing he did was cut out the last chapter of the book. And I don't know if you remember this, but in the last chapter of the book, Alex, it's really chilling. He says, uh, you know, I was young and uh, uh, I did things because I was young. Time for me to, like, grow up. And he has, you know, fantasies of sitting by a far side, settling down. It was just a phase. So all this mayhem that's happened for nine tenths of the book, and he cut that out, uh, which makes a very different ending. Well, he was he was actually ordered to put that in by the publisher in England only, not in America, because they thought uh, Burgess was. Yes, right. right. Burgess told me. I asked him why two endings. He went, No, I never intended for this. Right. last chapter in the English edition. It's just that whoever it was insisted right. that, that he put it in and make Alex, you know, good again or whatever. And uh, it was, uh, I, I asked Stanley. Stanley went, don't even read it. It's crap. Yeah. I went, okay. It has um, a much more cynical ending uh, than, than, you know. It sort of is, uh, yes. I mean, the ending that we You're have. You're back to your evil ways again and enjoying it. I was cured all right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, another flashback, back to If. 
all the books say that it was your first film, uh, but it wasn't, was it? Your first film yes, was Poor Yes, it was, Cow. Christopher. Poor Cow. No, Christopher, no. Ken Loach. I know where you're going with this, but it ain't working. It's, if it was my, the first film that I appeared in. You appear in? Yes. But the first film you shot was well, Poor Cow. You can't go and add to your credits things that you might have done or no, bits. No, you, you filmed it and you ended up on the cutting room floor. I right? filmed half the part. Oh. Carol White's boyfriend, Bobby. You played. Good God. See, I've done my homework. You certainly have. I, I wouldn't even know Bobby. That was his name? Good God. Okay. Well, a, yeah. um, yes. First off, <laughs> I did a, an audition. Um, it was Miriam Brickman again, the brilliant casting director of that period. I say brilliant because she cast me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but she was a friend, and she was a, a really very extraordinary woman. And... I remember doing, a, a, you know, just an improv. Um, I think maybe even with Carol White. And uh, from what I understood was I was going to play the lead in the thing. Mm. But suddenly they said, well, actually, no, because Joe Yanni, the producer, needed a name. So um, actually, Terrence Stamp is playing your part. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, but we've got a nice part for you, which was this Bobby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And in fact, it was uh, ridiculous. And uh, so this is what happened. Uh, Carol White, where they soaked us, wet us, uh, coming into my bed sitting room. Now, this is a time when what they did was Johnson's baby powder was done, uh, sort of covered the whole set in this bloody awful, and, and of course, dangerous to breathe, baby powder, which kind of gave us sort of I don't know, kind of a look to the thing with the, in the light, you know. And uh, I came in, um, went to a drawer to pick the towel. They told me the towel's in. It gave her the towel. Cut! What are you doing? I said, I, um, I said no, uh, sorry, I, um, there's no towel here. I'm sorry that the props didn't set the towel. And um, Ken goes, no, 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 I, just look for the towel. And I went, Oh, you want me to act looking for a towel? Um, is, am I to understand that? Because I can do that. I can do that very well. I can look through drawers. I can look. That's, you know, I mean, I didn't go to Rada, but I can do that. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> Christ, I was, you know, my first job. I would never say that. I was nothing. And so um, I came in, looked for the towel, gave it to her. And between takes, she just lay back. I was supposed to be making love to her. <laughs> she had absolutely no interest in just saying hello or anything. Oh, anyway, God bless her. She's not with us anymore. But um, she was an amazing actress, and she did this Kathy Come Home, and it was a <clears throat> huge, caused a huge thing about the homeless in England and stuff. But. Uh, and then I was supposed to do the beginning of the sequence, which was getting caught in the rain outside somewhere, and it didn't rain in London for a month. So they so couldn't match it. They couldn't match. Couldn't the match it, and I was xed out. And actually, I was actually thrilled because I didn't want my first movie to be Poor Cow. I wanted it to be If. Yeah, no, you which can I consider. First, and as Lindsay said after we finished shooting If. Well, Malcolm, for you, it's all downhill from here on in. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you something about if the last scene, right? yes. you're on the roof yes. with a machine gun. Yes. Uh, the girl is next to you throwing mortars down, and you've got all these dignitaries and the parents and the major general. I know what that. you're going to ask, Christopher. Yes, go on. Is it wish fulfillment, or is it supposed to be actually happening? It's a fantasy. I mean, if you look at the cuts... It comes back, there's nobody lying there in one cut. And then there's no continuity or anything. It's, we're on the thing shooting, and then there's explosions, and it's all in their minds. This is not Columbine. You know, this is not. This right. is a fantasy that these rebels have. Because when, when I first saw it in 68, yeah. um, you know, Street Fighting Man by Mick Jagger, the other Mick had come out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was, and Z, uh, you oh, know, Costa Gavras. A brilliant film. And it could have been a revolutionary movie. It could have been real in that context of 1968. Yes. You know, it might, and when I first saw it, I thought, oh, the black and white bits are fantasy. Then I thought, no, no, they're not. 
because it's completely arbitrary what's in black and white and what's in colour. Well, it. you know that now, but of course you thought that they yeah. had a meaning. Yeah, in I did, time. actually. I was and struggling. Lindsay, of course, wanted to fuck with your mind. Yeah, yeah but he succeeded. And, and, no. yeah, and <laughs> I'm thrilled and, about And that. I wondered why the last scene wasn't in black and white, you see, because I thought that would be logical. Of but course. But yes, well, you're right. It, yeah. You know, the black and white in, in If is because, you know, they couldn't afford, or they, there was no way they could shoot this 14th century chapel and light it, you know, you'd need 12 brutes. To, they didn't have that. They, it was impossible. So uh, you couldn't hang lights on the ceiling. So they did it in a monochrome. And, and I was sitting next to Lindsay watching the dailies. And he said, I do love black and white. What are we shooting tomorrow? Yeah. And he said, oh, well, well, let's do it in black and white. Totally. No, no. So you're just fucking with the audience's mind. Well, he's fucking with the critics. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. the and audience... Way, yeah, they all assume there's something... The audience is just accepted. Yeah, yeah. But the critics look for a reason. Yeah. But it's interesting, because, you know, there's a film of 1933 called Zero de Conduit by oh, Jean yes. Vigo, yeah. which has a similar structure to yes. if. Yeah. In that, they mean it. At the end, they really yes. are revolutionaries, and they're shooting yes. people. But clearly... Well, that's the difference in the time. And, you know, he, of course, Lindsay cribbed a lot yeah. from that film, and, and it's a brilliant film, <clears throat> and uh, rather s simplistic, but, but a beautiful film, that French film. And, um, I saw it many years later. And You're not at the time. No, and no. I went, Lindsay, I went, you <laughs> copied all that stuff. Are you kidding? <laughs> he goes, don't be ridiculous, Malcolm. I did not copy. I mean, you certainly did frame for frame. You. <laughs> I was just teasing. from the best. Always yeah, oh, well, that's right. Yeah. And Kubrick's, by the way, it's very influenced, Clockwork Orange, by Lindsay's If. Right. Way more than I thought. Yeah. And it was actually my wife who pointed it out and said, oh, my God, he just took chunks of it. Yeah. And you bring parts of Mick with you, as we've seen, really. There's, there's parts of Mick Travis in Alex. Don't you think? Sort of idealist underneath. Not, not the kind of thing that actors like oh, to I hear. Oh, I see, right. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't suggesting you were repeating an effect. OK, <laughs> I'm going to move on to something where you Hi. definitely weren't repeating an effect. I'm going to move on to Caligula. <laughs> oh, my God. Right. Oh, okay. God. Now, Thank you. Will you miss out the next clip, please, because we're going on to the Caligula clip in a moment. Um, well, now, what Caligula. Was the, what was the next clip? Uh, it was a bit of the Clockwork Orange, but I think oh. we've, uh, we've moved on. Oh, I think we've done Okay. It. 1976 yes. in Rome, yes. in the studios, yes. the Tinto Brass. Yes. Um, and if you ignore the bits which were added by Bob Guccione of Penthouse in post-production, yes. I think it's actually quite an interesting movie. It's trying to do something different with the epic, based on Gore yes. Vidal's script, where you know it's not the pompous wow. kind of Cecil B. DeMille type epic. It's much more sensual than that. It's not really based on Gore's script. By the time we came to do it, you know, Gore flaked out. You know. He, I mean, Gore's original script, look, I, I, Gore Vidal is an extraordinary writer, of course, a great novelist, but not a great screenwriter. You know, I think he'd done Myra Breckenridge or something before that. It's hardly, you know, it's, uh, but um, I didn't see it, actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> he wrote I can imagine. He wrote bits of Ben-Hur, actually. He did, did he? some script doctoring on Oh, Ben-Hur. I rather like Ben Hur, so I take it all back. Claims to inv have invented a, a gay relationship between Charlton Heston and Stephen Boyd, which nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Charlton Heston didn't notice. He so. certainly didn't. <laughs> the world wasn't ready for that. No, 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 I don't think Charlton was ready for that either. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so so, well, you know, I got the call from Gore, who said, I'm, "Malcolm, I'm." doing this film, it's called Gore Vidal's Caligula. That was the title. And I went, you mean a film by, Go no, Gore Vidal's Caligula. I went, oh, okay. And, you know, we'd just seen this brilliant uh, I, Claudius on BBC. And I thought, oh, geez, they're gonna have a lot to live up to. How do you, you know, how do you uh, cope with that? I mean, that was um, Robert Graves. And, yeah, and yeah. There, it was with Emily Williams in the Caligula part. I think, is that right? No, John Hurt. No, 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 I thought you meant the, the epic that never was. The one that uh, oh, no, no, Corner no, made. I'm, I'm that was on about television. The, the oh, one with you, the TV series. Yep, uh, yep, yep. Derek Jackson Sorry, was so you. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It was an incredible series yeah. anyway. And so, but, but of course there were no sets. I mean, it was all, as I remember, black and white with just the odd column or something. They did it on a budget, you know, and so did we, but our budget went 
crazy, you know. We had Danilo Donati, mm. who was Fellini's designer and all that. And I love the sets because it's sort of oh, Mussolini's yeah. Rome as yes. much as ancient Rome. Yes, it yes. feels like the 1930s. It's brilliant, I think. The sets. Well, and Tinto Brass, the director, and he got he got hired because Guccione went in to watch a test or something, walked into the wrong. Um, screening room <laughs> and saw some of Salon Kitty oh, yeah. and all these naked girls running around and he went wow this is great I mean this this is this is, should be Caligula should be doing this and so hired him you know it was like what and you know we could have had um, Nick Rogue yeah. Nick Rogue wanted to do it I was dying to work with him really? and I was in a restaurant Nick Rogue came over to me because he was in his cups and said so I hear I'm not to be your master. <laughs> I said, that is right, Nick. And um, I don't, even if you were going to do the film, I think it would have been nice. We'd have worked together. It wouldn't have been a master pupil relationship, I hope. And he went, yes, it would. Oh. <laughs> he was just fucking with me, you know. But you, you had, you're an excellent company. You've got Gilgood as oh, Nerva. Johnny Gilgood. O'Toole as Tiberius yes. Caesar. Uh, Helen Mirren as your wife, Sezonia. It's I, a big, it's a great cast. It is a great cast, yes. All post-synchronized, presumably, as Italian movies were. It was supposed to be direct sound. Yeah. First take, I'm doing something, bouncing a ball, doing something, and the... Uh, tr uh, the dolly ran over somebody's foot, and then, in the middle, I went, uh, what, what happened? Well, sorry, I, who was that? Uh, I'm in the middle of this thing. I've got uh, two pages of monologue, and somebody's inter... I said, what happened? They go, what? Oh, no, you just ran over my foot, you know, in Italian. And I said, I'm sorry he did that, but fuck, can you do it silently? <laughs> they had no clue about being quiet, you know, that was it, you just, yeah. and then supposed to be, you know, in English, of course, so the head of the um, guard or whatever comes in, and I say, uh, uh, you know, what's, what, what's happening, or what now, or whatever it is, he goes, one, two, three, four, revolution, <laughs> one, two, three, he kept repeating it, I said, yes, I heard that, <laughs> what, I said, script, where's the script, <laughs> darling, um, could you ask, what, what's going on here? This has nothing to do with the, what's he saying? One, two, three, four, revolution, what the fuck is that? She goes, well, he's just moving his lips because they're gonna add the, I went, well. <laughs> it was so much fun. Yes. I got, yeah. I got, There's that great I, line. Do you remember the film uh, Day for Night by True? Yes, of course. Valent Valentina Cortese, yeah. so, where she's, she's being <laughs> upbraided for not knowing her words. She says, with Federico, I just do numbers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we had this amazing set that they built where it was um, Tiberius's grotto out in Capri. And they'd spent weeks on it and I think it was like a three acre site just outside of Rome and it was Peter O'Toole playing Tiberius and I was in the scene with him and um, so you know they, they were doing all these weird sexual fantasies and all that and they were placing it all it was a night shoot we were called four o'clock Peter and I four o'clock in the afternoon we did not get onto the set until 4 a.m. And so the producer, this man, Roberto Rossellini, the, um, yeah, related, is the uncle of, uh, uh, what's her name, her? Um, Isabella. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so um, he said, Mal Camino, which is what he called me. Um, darling, go in and Peter, go through the, the, the lines with Peter. I went, oh, God, okay. So, hi, Pete. Um, hello, Peter. Do you want to go through the lines, darling? They want me to. Uh, come in, darling. <laughs> mm. I go, no, no, God, no. I, I think we're working in a minute, darling. He goes, no, darling, we're not going to get on there for a few hours. Let's have some fun. Okay. And, of course, he knew the dialogue. Rome was but a city, uh, whatever it was. And so, 
literally smoking joints like they were going out of fashion. Now, I was terrified of being high, you know, working. I didn't want to get high, so, but, but, we, I was in his trailer. I was as high as a bloody kite from contact. And uh, four o'clock in the morning, they're banging on the door, they're ready. And O'Toole stands up, he's weaving. He's literally chain-smoked. 20 joints, I don't know. <laughs> um, we come out, and, and literally we're dressed, you know, in the Roman garb, and he's got these little legs, you know, tiny little spindly things. He's wearing a diaper <laughs> and, and a, a sort of white thing here with one stitch here and one stitch there, flowing, everything falling out and he's weaving, and we go to the set, and we look around, and there's like, you know, at least 300 people there in absolutely every form of fornication you could think of. <coughs> there were, you know, deformed people fucking. There were huge dildols on swings, and... There were dwarfs fucking. I don't know whether you're allowed to say that word anymore, but more people. There were every kind of fucking known to man. <laughs> and Peter and I are sort of, well, I was a little stunned because I was been in contact with him, of course. He was rip roaring and ready to go and goes, Room was but us. Jesus, darling, what are they doing over there? <laughs> I, mean, I think we're, 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 we're running, Pete. We're running, darling. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, over here. This is the, your marks over here. What? What? Here. Yeah. Room. What? Jesus. Who? <laughs> oh, is that a dick? Oh, my God. So this went on. <laughs> and I kid you not, I am not even exaggerating. See the film, if you like. Um, yeah. I, we're going to do a clip in a minute. We've got a great... Uh, do you, Helen Mirren. Helen, oh, you're right, I haven't finished. I'm so sorry. Well, it's all right. I, am I going on too long? No, no, long? you're doing fine. Well, okay, so let me quickly... So we come to... This, this, the whole point of the scene is that there is a drunk... Uh, uh, Tiberius said, do you think this man is drunk? One of the sentries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I say, yes, my lord. I, and he goes more wine, and they stick a funnel down this poor soldier, and they pour you know, these skins of wine into the poor man, and, and then we go around, do the whole scene, come back, and there's the sentry who's completely drunk because he's been forced all this, and so what they've done is they've got this sort of skin like a beach ball, and they stuck it under his breastplate, and the whole idea is for Peter to stab it with his sword, yeah. and out of the breastplate, falls these chicken gizzards with wine and all that, and they look so disgusting and all the rest, and that was supposed to be his entrails. So, come round, he goes to me, do you think, Caligula, do you think this man is drunk? And I go, yes, my lord, I think this man is drunk. He goes, so! <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, ow. <clears throat> he walks over so subtly, Mm. <laughs> Wax the guy, the breastplate flies up, hits him in the face, <laughs> smack, the beach ball lands on the floor and bounces like <laughs> a bomb. And 300 people are aghast looking at it. And O'Toole and I, he's looking at it. He looks up at me and says, I think she's dropped her fucking handbag. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, God. H Helen Mirren's uh, judgment on the film is wonderful. She called it an irresistible mixture of art and genitals. <laughs> which I think is about right. Let's have a clip from Caligula. Uh, we chose this for great care, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, it's when you're riding your beloved horse into the oh. assembly of notables. Yes. You suddenly get very paranoid about someone called Jamelus, who you think might be trying to uh, do one over you. Yes. And uh, your sister, with whom you're in love, Drusilla, is getting worried about your Played by mental state. Therese Ansaboy, right. a very beautiful girl. And, and she's had a sort of rivalry with Helen Mirren, who plays <coughs> your wife. 
you need to set that up, really. So let's have the clip from Caligula, please. <laughs> and there's no centurions with bitch balls. You'll be glad to hear. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Apparently, your performance as Caligula was an inspiration to Leonardo DiCaprio for Jordan Belfort in The Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, not for uh, Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yes. Do you know, Caligula is uh, the most commercially successful porn film ever made. It's probably the most successful film I've ever made. <laughs> $27 billion it made, but uh, yeah, in, it, in its uh, Guccione film. How do you film. know all this? Well, I've done a bit of homework. You, you know, have, but, yeah, indeed. Yeah, okay. Very impressive. Um, so after Caligula, you make your first Hollywood film proper, Time After Time. Yes. Yes, um, yes, yes. Playing H.G. Wells, opposite yep. Mary Steenburgen. Yes, um, yes. Who plays the foreign exchange lady, Amy Robbins, and you married her a year later. Yes, I fell in love with her. We were there is real chemistry between you on the screen, I must uh, say. We had so much fun, my God. Um, San Francisco was such, it is such a beautiful city, and to make this film and play this wonderfully, win after this mayhem, yeah. this buggery, this... Mm. debauchery of, uh, of a whole year in Rome. <laughs> of course, it was wonderful, too, you know. Yeah. But um, I thought I was going crazy, and, and I read this beautiful story of this sort of love story thriller yeah. about H.G. Wells chasing Jack the Ripper in the time machine to um, <clears throat> modern-day uh, San Francisco. And, you know, Wells was this great character of this socialist. He was uh, a women's liber way before his time and all the rest of it. So it was a wonderful thing to have him, you know, meet uh, an independent woman mm. and, and try and deal with it. And um, is, it, is it true that uh, just before you shot, I think, the sequence we're about to see, you whispered in Mary Steenburgen's ear, I'm madly in love with you and I'm going to marry you one day, just before the off. Is that true? I think I gave her a date. Right. That, that, that's not done. No, <clears throat> it's not done, but we only had one shot at this. <laughs> yeah. And I am a calculating actor. <laughs> ah, right. Uh, and we were in love, you know, we were in love, but um, we only had this restaurant. Is it the Rotunda restaurant? Is no, that? It's, it's seeing her for the first time. In oh, the seeing bank. her for the first time, okay. Well, um, no, so it, it, that happened uh, in the Rotunda restaurant oh, right, sequence, right, right. which we only had the restaurant for two hours or something. And um, it's a, another beautiful scene, which you haven't got. But, um, <laughs> so let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the one you do have. Yeah, thank you very much. Is it true you played 78 records of, um, 78 RPM records of H.G. Wells's voice when you were preparing the character? Yeah. I, I knew somebody at the BBC, and I thought, well, I'm going to America, you know, this is the home of the method. Um, I, I, better, I better do a bit of method. So I thought I better find out about H.G. Wells. So I, I read a, <clears throat> you know, a biography about him. And, and then, uh, so I had a friend at the BBC and I said, please, do you have any recordings of H.G. Wells? Because I, I, I would love to uh, hear them so that I, I could you know, copy, at least attempt to copy how he sounded. And so the, the 78, you know, records came through in a brown thing, and I put them on the turntable, and it came through, you know, clicking and scratch, and, <laughs> and, and it, it, and H.G. Wells sounded like that. <laughs> and he was doing an interview, and he was from South East London, and he had a very high voice. And I went, what? <laughs> oh, fuck. Well, there goes the method then. <laughs> yes, no, you didn't. Uh, I went, didn't no, go. no, no. I don't think Hollywood's going to understand that. But, you know, I come on the set and go, oh, hello, Amy Robbins. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see it. Can we have the <laughs> clip from time after time, please, so we can see what you did say? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. It's very sweet. Very sweet. She's uh, beautiful, absolutely stunning. She was a terrific actress, and in her next film, she won an Academy Award, Melbourne and Howard. Oh, yes, about Howard Hughes. And, uh, yes, yeah. exactly, yeah. 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 Um, and then in the year 2000, you come back to England for Gangster Number 1, 
yes. which you've called uh, my best work since A Clockwork Orange, where you play gangster number 55. And I mean this as a compliment. You seem to be channeling James Cagney throughout. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, look, uh, James Cagney was always, always my favorite actor, always. I, I, I don't pretend that I could even get anywhere near that man, but um, I did. I do love James Cagney so much. You know, his, the way he dances and the way he, his rapid fire, you know. And uh, there's a little bit at the end is an homage when, uh, you know, I'm yeah. screaming number one. Um, and it's, like, it's like the end of White Heat. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Made it exactly. on our top of the world. Only you say, I'm number one as you sit exactly, on the ledge. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We had a bit of fun there. See, the, um, Libby Barr's here. Now, Libby, um, she was the continuity, the script girl, lady. And she's a Scottish and very proper, you know. And uh, this uh, film is full of absolute disgusting language, which just sort of becomes Shakespearean. It's all... And, and excuse me for saying it, but it's all, you fucking cunt, you calling me a cunt, you fucking cunt. <laughs> and it's all scripted, everything is scripted. And so I always had a lot of fun every day when I had these great speeches. I would go, you fucking cunt, you line. <laughs> <laughs> line, Libby. <laughs> <laughs> And she would go, you know perfectly well what the line is, Malcolm. <laughs> and, and I've taken a lot of trouble choosing a clip where you don't say that. No, actually, because, of course. Never mind. But, but um, blurt, in America, of course, you say cunt, and they just, well, go into, they practically drag you off to jail, you know. No, no. I have to say, look, in England, it's a term of endearment. You know, <laughs> you silly old cunt, you know. <laughs> Uh, th this is the scene where you're in London's Chinatown and you're paying a visit on Eddie Marson, oh, who plays Eddie, yeah, he's a wonderful, and uh, yeah. uh, uh, you're dropping in on him. And it's a lovely moment because I think what you put over in it is you seem hard, very hard on the surface, yeah. but you, you've got very low self-esteem underneath all that. And you're really shocked by one of the things he says. It's a great moment. Yeah. Can we have the clip from Gangster Number One, please? Can I ask, have we got time for one or two questions from the audience? Is there someone from the BFI who can wave at me? Yeah. We have? Yeah. yeah, great, okay. Let's, uh, now's the moment to, yeah, gentleman there in the fourth row. Well, it was um, extremely close. Um, <clears throat> you know, he was um, a, a really wonderful um, friend, you know. Uh, I mean, of course, I was an actor that he was employing. and But, you know, when you're working on something that's like that, when the character is in every frame, practically, of the film, um, he's reliant on you also. I mean, you don't realize that quite at the time. You just feel very grateful that you've been asked to do it. But the truth is, he had put the script away. He couldn't find anyone to do it. He couldn't find the qualities that he wanted in someone. I don't know why he chose me. Actually, I asked him. I said, why did you choose me? And he went, because um, you show intelligence on the screen. I went, can you say that a bit louder? <laughs> <laughs> he actually said that. I'm not making it up. That's what he said. Anyway, um, of course, I agree with him, but... Um. <laughs> is, it, is it true that uh, uh, he said to you, w when you're in post-production, that uh, you're going to have to appear on American TV shows and you're going to have to say to everybody that I'm a genius? Yeah. Is that true? Yes. To which you replied? I can't remember? remember what I said. I, I think... He um, said, well, what about me? What, what am I going to say about me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. And he said, you're, you're an OK actor. Yeah. Because I'm going to say you're, you're a very good actor. I went, oh, well, that's a lovely trade-off. You're a genius, and I'm a good actor. Thanks a lot. But I love the idea he's saying to you, when you appear on these yeah. TV shows, you will say, yes. I've been working for a genius. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Well, of course, I couldn't say that, but I can say it now. Oh, that's nice. Uh, well, I love Jay Lee Thompson. He was a fantastic old Hollywood director and a, a, a real gentleman, a lot of fun. 
You know, it was Anthony, it was a hell of a cast. Anthony Quinn, James Mason, oh, uh, Pat, uh, Patricia O'Neill, and uh, God, I can't remember who else, but, um, oh, Christopher Lee. Um, <laughs> uh, playing a small part of a gypsy, which he insisted he had have his clothes made by a tailor in Hollywood. I'm going, he's playing a gypsy for Christ's sake. Um, that's the difference between us. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know why I'm even saying that, but um, uh, I had fun teasing him a bit. But it, honestly, it, it was a terrible script. I mean, and, and it was the sort of, uh, in 1973, the oil embargo came. I don't know whether you remember that. You're probably not old enough. But when the oil embargo came, there were queues for petrol and all the rest of it. The, uh, the British film industry, as it was known, kind of disappeared. The Americans here, who were the engine room of the, the whole industry, up sticks and left en masse in 73. Suddenly, these interesting films that were produced and financed by Americans were no longer there. And the British film industry just literally collapsed. So and I, I say this as, as giving you an idea of where we're at. So I go into my agent, Dennis Selinger at ICM, I go in then and I say, well, is there anything? And he goes, yeah, I've got a lovely script for you. Yeah, we'll read that. I went, oh, the passage. And I went, Jesus, this is horrible. <laughs> horrible. He goes, yeah, well, we've got Anthony Quinn's doing it. And we've got, uh, we've got uh, you know, uh, James Mason. And I said, well, um, I suppose I better do it then. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'm so glad I did because it was really weird, you know, you haven't got a clip, have you? No. Oh, good. No, no. This is unscripted. <laughs> Thank God for that. Okay. Uh, so um, I got it into my head for some extraordinary reason. Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, Lee J. Thompson, you know, the first scene up, I'm playing a nasty Nazi, of course, naturally, who's chasing uh, the family of James Mason, who's this nuclear scientist just about to give the Germans the bomb, uh, or, or the, he's defecting to the West to give the West the bomb. So, and and um, uh, what's his name? Quinn is a Basque guide who's taken him over the mountains. I'm a nasty Nazi who's chasing them, right? It's really ridiculous. Anyway, <laughs> so the first scene up, Lady J. Lee Thompson said, Malk, you're first up with the rape. I went, oh, <laughs> really? Do we have to start with that? And he goes, yes, I'm sorry, but we have to start with the rape. So, uh, and this girl who I was supposed to be raping was married to David Cassidy. Her name, <laughs> yes, the pop. So her name was Kay Lentz, very nice girl, Southern California. And you know, James Mason goes, why has she got a Southern California accent when I'm her father? I said, I don't know, darling, but you know, it's just the casting. I... Anyway, so I'm supposed to rape her in a shower. She's in the shower. I'm supposed to rape her. And you know, it's, we're given two days to do this. Six days. Six days. She wouldn't show this. She wouldn't show that. Now, listen, whatever. If you accept the part, you read the damn script, you know what's in it, you know you've got to show your bum and your tits. You know, that's it. If you're supposed to be raped, what the hell can I do? So, um, no, it went on. She, anyway, she came out finally after on the fifth day or whatever it was with pasties here. Pasties. She looked like a hot cross bun. <laughs> <laughs> And she came out, I looked, I mean, the look on my face was absolute gobsmacked. I looked at this girl and thought, oh my God, I mean, uh, this is a joke, right? I, I, just, I just started laughing. 
And, and so, and then I said to the, uh, the, the costumer, it was a lovely, lovely guy, I said, would you mind making me a, a jock strap and putting a sequined um, swastika on the... <laughs> because I think Kay Lentz is up for a big surprise. <laughs> so, of course, the trousers come down, and mm, 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 I was twerking. I didn't know I was way ahead of my time. <laughs> and... Uh, the cameraman who had a held camera and they're quite heavy in those days because they were big then started to he started to go like and he have to he had to offload the camera onto the bed and uh, so that's how we started the passage which I fondly named the back passage <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. but I literally I literally gave one of the best or one of the worst performances of my career because I literally thought, you know what, they're paying me a lot of money. I'm just going to do the whole fucking Nazi regime in one character. <laughs> so I was doing this in front of the mirror. I was doing, you know, what's his name? Uh, Strange love. <laughs> exactly. Well, I was, you know, I was literally uh, having so much fun with it and going crazy. And J. Lee Thompson, bless his heart, was egging me on. <laughs> he goes, I love that. And do you know uh, Hitler's chauffeur? He had underwear with uh, swastikas, swastikas on it. So you've hit on the right thing there. I went, it was a joke. <laughs> I said, but okay, let's go with it. Can I finish on one, uh, one thing, a quote of yours, which I think is, is, is a very interesting quote. The most nurturing of directors can make you feel too comfortable. You don't really push for that extra whatever with a nurturing director. Do you stand by that? If they're too nice and you haven't got anything to collide with, do you, do you feel that you're not getting the spark? I, I don't know why I said oh, that. That's a good line. It's a very it's good line. It is a good line. Um, it is, because you've worked with some difficult ones. You've worked with Losi, uh, yes. Lindsay Anderson to some extent, Kubrick. You've worked with some difficult people. Uh, all the bloody difficult ones. And, yet, and they bring the best out in you. Yes, I always say I could never do that performance for probably a, a, a nurturing director that, that I did in Clockwork. But uh, yes, well, uh, I don't want to say that because, of course, I love working with nurturing directors because uh, okay. it's so nice you know and to feel comfortable but but to go out there somewhere where i don't know yeah some with a strong point of view you see yes. some, something to fight yes um and lindsay anderson said about when when you you asked him to name any particular quality uh, that you have uh he said um you're dangerous did he yeah I did. I when you were going to do in celebration, he was trying to get you to oh, do in celebration. He Your asked friends. me to do the part that Alan Bates had yeah. played in London, and I'd seen it ten times. I was in awe of Alan's performance, and it's such a great play, David's story. And so when Lindsay said he called me and he said, "Are you doing any of those awful films of yours?" <laughs> no, it's exactly what he said. And I went, "No, I've just finished one." He said, "Good. I come over. I want to talk to you." He said, I want you to do In Celebration in New York. And I went, follow Alan? There's no way I'm following Alan in that part. I mean, I couldn't, couldn't possibly. He goes, don't be ridiculous, Malcolm. I mean, are you saying that only one actor can play Hamlet? I said, no, of course not. But I, 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 he's indelible in my mind. I, I mean, he goes, you have totally different qualities to Alan Bates. I said, really? Well, what does Alan Bates have? He goes, jocular charm. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, um, what do I have? Danger. Yeah. Oh, no jocular charm. No, but I no think... not much. <laughs> uh, from tonight's clips, I think we can, we can see what he meant. Uh, Malcolm, I can only say that uh, Bog and all his holy angels and saints must have been watching over your career for the last 50 years, and we're really pleased you came with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris.